Hi, welcome to Spry Online for Sunday, January 30th. I'm Luke Harbaugh, one of the pastors here at Spry Church, and we are so excited to have you joining us for worship. Today we're concluding our series called Renew, where we've been exploring what it means to renew and revitalize our relationship with God as we move into a new year and hopefully a new season in our walk with Jesus. God has a message of hope for you and me today. Let's worship together. Great, you love. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we worship you today, we uh, take a moment to just remember your promises to us in your holy word, that you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us, that you have promised to uphold us with your mighty and righteous right hand, and that you have told us that you will be with us until the end of the age. And so as we come into this time of worship, my prayer for us is that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, and that we would lay hold of and and lay claim to those promises that you have made, knowing that you are working all things for good for those who love you and are walking according to your will. And so, Lord, as we explore your word today, as we continue to lift our voices and our hearts to you, we pray that those promises would be ours, and that as we come out of this time today, we would be better and closer followers of your Son, Jesus. We pray all these things in his great name. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Ezra, and it's Ezra chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today marks the last day in our series called Renew, where we've been looking at what it means uh, after and really still within this season of disruption that we've all experienced, what it means to renew our faith. And to kick us off today, I want us to read a passage of scripture together that comes from the book of Isaiah. Uh, And if you were here, I would ask you to read it out loud with me. So if you want to do that in your living room or in your car or wherever you're listening to this, go ahead and read it with me. Uh, But take a second and read this sentence. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And this concept of God's hand uh, is an idea that we actually see all across Scripture. Uh, Anytime we see it, it's used usually in a way to describe God's action or God's activity in the world and in our lives. And so multiple authors of scripture, like Isaiah does here, especially the Old Testament, uh, use this metaphor of God's hand to talk about how God guides us and leads us and saves us, corrects us, and generally how he moves us and moves the things in the world around to do his will. And if you think about it, that's actually a very fitting way to describe God's activity, right? Uh, Think about your own life. If you've ever had to lead or guide someone who was maybe weak or a little unsteady on their feet, maybe a grandparent, somebody who was getting back on their feet after an injury, how do we do it? We usually take our hand, right? And we kind of guide them or move them with an outstretched arm and get them in the right place. We see this especially with kids, right? Those of you that have done this with kids, if they're a little unsteady on their feet, haven't been walking for a while, uh, or we're walking them through a crowd in a busy place, We usually take their hand or at the very least put a hand on their shoulder or on their back and we kind of help navigate them through. One of my favorite things on YouTube uh, are the videos and the compilations of dads who like sense danger and end up like snatching their kids out of a dangerous situation like falling off the sofa. Um, And it's usually right with an outstretched arm and a hand. And so all throughout the Bible, this is how the authors of Scripture uh, describe God's action in our lives. His hand protects, it rescues, it guides, and it works on our behalf. Over the past few weeks, uh, we've been looking at the books of Ezra and a little bit at Nehemiah as well. And when they were first written, Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book telling one complete story. Uh, And what's interesting about that is that as you read Ezra and Nehemiah, especially if you read them as one continuous story, Uh, this concept of God's hand actually comes up over and over again. In fact, uh, the phrase, the hand of God, is used six times in the book of Ezra alone. Now, if you haven't been with us the last few weeks, let me bring you up to speed a little bit on what Ezra and Nehemiah is all about. Uh, About 500 years before Jesus was born, a nation called Babylon conquered the nation of Judah and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And most notably, they also destroyed the Jewish temple that was there. And when they did that, they took all the religious leaders, everybody from the government, everybody with influence and power, and they kind of flung them all across the empire as a way of separating them from each other and stripping them of their power. But about 70 years later, uh, the Babylonians themselves were conquered by a new military power in the region known as the Persians. And the Persians had a very different policy towards the Jews. 
And they actually issued a decree that allowed any Jews who had been exiled to return to Jerusalem, to rebuild the city, and to rebuild the temple. And so the books of Ezra and Nehemiah follow the different waves of people who make their journey back to Jerusalem and go about the work of rebuilding the city and reestablishing their way of life. But the thing that undergirds the whole story, and the only reason really the people in the story are successful, is not because of their own effort, even though their effort is a necessary piece of the puzzle, but the reason they have success is because of the way that God moves in their midst, because of the guidance and, in particular, the intervention of God's hand. In just a second, uh, we're going to look at one specific story from these books uh, where this point is clear. But first, let's do a quick survey of a few of the examples. Uh, The event that kicks off the whole story uh, is that one of the Persian kings, King Cyrus, issues a decree that allows everyone to return to their homelands. But take a look at the reason it happens. The scripture says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also put it in writing, and then it goes on from there. The decree, right, that Cyrus gives only occurs because God moves him. Cyrus wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a devout believer in the God of the Jews, right? And yet he still is moved to make this statement. And that as you move ahead in the story, uh, Ezra is allowed to go back to Jerusalem by the Persian king and start his part of the work on the city because, and the Bible says, the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord was upon him. And so we see, right, God's hand intervening and interacting in the story. And then finally, as Ezra and the people make their journey back to Jerusalem, Ezra is nervous about the trip. And while he wants to ask the king for protection from you know, other armies and robbers along the route, he doesn't want to look afraid. And so instead, he prays to God that he and the people would be protected as they go. And then in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 9, we're told that they do arrive safely in Jerusalem. Why? It says, On the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of of his God upon him. And that's just a, a snippet of the references to the hand of God in the book of Ezra. But as you read it, what becomes clear, right, is that behind all of the major events in this story is the good hand of God. Uh, God's action, right, his guidance, his intervention, his protection, his provision is really what's making the work of his people in Jerusalem possible. One of the other places that we see this uh, early, is early on in the book of Nehemiah as well. And remember, like we said, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were originally one book. And so what we read as the early chapters of Nehemiah is actually the middle of the story as it was originally told. And Nehemiah um, becomes the guy who leads the third wave of Jews back to Jerusalem. So over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about the other waves. So the first was Zerubbabel, uh, who helped rebuild the temple. The second wave was Ezra, who helped the people reestablish their religious identity in Jerusalem through the Torah. And then the third is led by Nehemiah, uh, who eventually leads the project to help them rebuild the walls of the city. But the story of how he gets there is pretty amazing. And it all unfolds because of, you probably guessed it by now, because of the hand of God. Now, when we meet Nehemiah, uh, he's serving in the court of the king of Persia, and he has the position of cupbearer. And the cupbearer was the person uh, who brought the king and all of his guests wine. And sometimes he even drank the wine first before the king did to make sure it wasn't poisoned. And one day, uh, Nehemiah's brother comes to visit Nehemiah with a group of guys who were from Judah, uh, which is where the city of Jerusalem was located. And Nehemiah, uh, being a good Jewish boy, asks them how things are going for the Jewish people in the holy city of Jerusalem. And this is what they say. Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, uh, for the people of Jerusalem, things aren't going very well. Uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra had done their work in rebuilding the temple and reigniting the religious life of the city, but there was still this underlying sense of pain and this underlying sense of inadequacy that was among the people. 
And the reason for this is a little bit hard for us to understand, but part of what was driving that feeling of inadequacy was the fact that the wall around the city was still crumbling and that the gates themselves hadn't been rebuilt. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? So in the ancient world, part of what made you safe as a city and safe as a people was to have a sturdy wall right around your city with a series of strong gates that could keep foreign invaders out. And so without them, if you lived there, there would be this, this constant state of unease. And the people of Jerusalem were constantly under threat because they had no gates, they had no walls. I don't know if maybe you've ever stayed in a place um, like an apartment or a hotel room somewhere that didn't quite feel secure enough uh, and you were a little freaked out trying to get to sleep. Um, earlier this year, I was staying in a hotel all by myself uh, and about 6 a.m. I heard a click. So I woke up and I sat straight up in bed and I looked over towards the door, which is where the sound was coming from. And I see the door start to very slowly open and it opens about four or five inches until it hits the panic bar. And then it slowly closes again. Uh, and keep in mind, I was all by myself. Um, nobody else had a key to my room that I knew of. And it was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever, ever had staying in a place. And I can also tell you, I did not go back to sleep after that, right? Like I was gone. I was out of there because uh, I knew I wasn't going to rest easy. And so these torn down walls, right? And these burnt down gates that are outside of the city of Jerusalem would have been a, a constant and stark reminder of the fact that the people were unsafe and of what had happened to them before, right? That they had been invaded, that they'd been killed, that they'd been exiled, and really dominated by these couple of foreign powers for almost a full century. And when Nehemiah right, hears that this is still the situation, that after all the efforts towards renewal, uh, that, that this, it still looks like this in Jerusalem, this is how he responds. He says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And Nehemiah feels a stirring in his soul to do something about the state that the people in the city are in. And he prays for God to do something about it. And specifically, specifically he prays that God might give him favor in the sight of the king for whom he is the cupbearer. That King Artaxerxes might help him and in turn, help Nehemiah's people. And so he prays. He says, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, this man being the king. Now, a few days later, Nehemiah finds himself back in the king's court, serving him his wine. And Artaxerxes looks at Nehemiah and he can tell that something is wrong. And the text says that Artaxerxes says that Nehemiah has a sadness of the heart. And so Artaxerxes asks Nehemiah, he says, what's bothering you? And Nehemiah tells him that, that his heart is broken for his people because of the state that their holy city is in. And the king looks at Nehemiah and he asks him, he says, what do you request? In other words, you know, Nehemiah, you've, I've known you for a long time. You've served me well as my cupbearer. Like, is there anything that I can do about that? which in and of itself is already an answer to Nehemiah's prayer, right? But remember, Artaxerxes is literally the most powerful person, not just in that region, but in the whole world at the time. And so it would make sense for Nehemiah to tread kind of lightly here, not make him angry, not make too many requests, um, because I'm sure as good as Nehemiah was at pouring wine, there were probably a lot of other people who were ready to take his place if the king did away with him. But Nehemiah prays to God again and asks for favor, and then... He looks at the king and he asks, he says, can I have an extended leave to go to Jerusalem myself and help them rebuild the city? And the king seems agreeable to that idea. So he pushes a little bit further and he asks, he says, well, can you also you know, send letters to, gov to the governors of all the other areas between here and Jerusalem so that I can have safe passage between here and there? And again, Artaxerxes seems agreeable to that. And so Nehemiah pushes even a little bit further. And he says, well, maybe you could also, you know, send a letter to Asaph, who is the keeper of the king's forest, where the king's trees live, and tell him to give me timber so that I can rebuild the gates and rebuild the wall and rebuild my house in Jerusalem. And again, the king seems agreeable to all of that. And at the end of his speech, and all of the, everything that Nehemiah had asked for kind of comes true. Nehemiah says this, And the king granted me what I asked for, 
for the gracious hand of my God was upon me. And here's what Nehemiah knew. Nehemiah knew that while he had a part to play, right, he had to go to the king and ask. He had to go to Jerusalem and do the work himself. He knew that while he had a part to play, the success or the failure of this task of renewal was dependent upon God, right? God's willingness to move on his behalf. He knew that Artaxerxes was the one who had authority to either open or close this opportunity. But what he knew more than that was that God was the one who had authority over Artaxerxes, right? God was the one who had to make him compassionate towards Nehemiah's mission. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. See, one of the things that we believe about God is that, is that God is sovereign, which means that he has ultimate power and ultimate authority over everything. And so God's hand can and does move whatever God wants it to. God's hand, right, can change circumstances, can overrule the laws of nature if he wants to. God's hand can transform hearts, generate resources, carry out God's will in any and every circumstance. And Nehemiah recognized this, which is why, right, when his heart was broken by the state of his people, he fell on his knees and asked God to intervene because he knew that the power to change his circumstances and the circumstances of his people lay not within himself, but within God. According to scripture and according to stories like Nehemiah's, right, what we know is that we have a sovereign God who is willing to move his hand on our behalf. And that doesn't mean that it always goes exactly like we want or it always turns out precisely like we imagine. But what we know is that God does work where we can't see, God does listen to our prayers, and God's hand does intervene and move if we are willing to humble ourselves before God and pray so that we can stir him to action on our behalf. When Nehemiah says, the gracious hand of my God was upon me, uh, that, great, that word for gracious is the Hebrew word hatoba, uh, which is from the root tob, which means beautiful or pleasant or agreeable or good. And sometimes when we talk about God's sovereignty, right, the conversation can get a little bit weird, or a little bit hairy, because it raises questions that people have debated for centuries. Like, if God is sovereign, why does bad things happen, right? And if bad things happen to me, does that mean that God wanted them to happen to me? And if God is sovereign, why doesn't he stop the bad things from happening? And all those are, are meaningful and legitimate questions that have to be asked. But because of those questions, we sometimes miss the forest for the trees. And we miss the fact that over and over again, it's demonstrated in Scripture that we have a God that is prepared to move in good ways on our behalf and for his glory. It is the good, sovereign hand of God that was upon Nehemiah. And if you are in Christ, that same good, gracious hand of God is upon you and upon your life. And so as we close out this series on renewal, what I think we all need to wrestle with is this question of whether or not we treat God like we believe this about him, right? Do, do we believe he's sovereign? Do we believe he's good? And do we believe he will act on our behalf in that sovereignty and in that goodness? Like we talked about last week, in all of our lives, right, there are hurdles, there are barriers that try to stand in the way of the renewal of our faith. We all experience trials and resistance. But if we believe these things about God, then we should be seeking God to help us overcome them. We should be asking him to use his hand to clear them out of our path, to give us favor in the eyes of those who, who resist us, to influence those around us, to change our circumstances, to, to bring us to places and people and environments where we can experience his favor and renewal more readily. And if we take Ezra and Nehemiah's example to heart, what we should see is that he is often far more ready to do that than we are to ask. So we should always be looking for places in our lives where we can invite God to be on the move on our behalf and for his kingdom and his glory. We have friends uh, who run a ministry in India, and part of what they do there is they give women who are living in poverty sewing machines. They train them how to use them so that they can use those sewing machines to create products to sell so that they can make an income and provide for their families. And one of the things that the ministry does for these women is they organize little markets and fairs and bazaars so that they can bring all the things that they've made to sell them to the public. Think of the spry yard sale. Only everything has been made by women in India. <laughs> But in order to do those markets and help those women sell their goods, uh, they need permits, they need licenses, and they need the favor of the local governmental authorities in order to actually put them on. 
And if you know anything about life in India right now, you know that for Christians, there's a lot of persecution, especially from the government, which is very pro-Hindu and very anti-Christian, especially in some areas. And so when these people that we know uh, first submitted their paperwork to have one of these bazaars or one of these markets, they got rejected. And so they started praying that the hearts of the local Hindu leaders would change and that they would get a license. And then they got rejected again. So they kept praying and they got rejected again. And so they kept praying. And then finally, after months and months of prayer, they were approached by one of the local representatives to kind of hear them out. And after hearing about their ministry, right, the way they serve the poor, and how they were trying to help these women make money and care for their families, this local representative changed his mind. And now, against all odds, these Hindu officials who are not uh, interested in Christianity at all, right, not only do they tolerate, but they actually promote these church-run, Christ-based markets in their community. And they do them pretty regularly. And what do you think our friends who run this ministry credit for that change? the gracious hand of God. Right? He was the one who changed the hearts of those leaders and opened their minds to pave the way for all of it to happen. And so even in today's world, the story of Ezra and Nehemiah continues. The gracious hand of God is still active in our world and active in our lives. And so as we close out this series, I encourage you to think about this question. Where can you invite the gracious hand of God to move in your life? And you're invited to humble yourself and pray and simply ask for that hand to move for you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you and give you praise. We give you glory for this wonderful promise that you move on our behalf, that somehow our prayers make it to your ears, and that somehow that stirs you to move on our behalf. But Lord, we know that it's really not about us in the end, that it's really about you, um, bringing you and yourself glory, bringing fame to your son's name, and building your kingdom here. And so Lord, my prayer is that as we go forward as a people, we would pray to you with boldness, we would pray to you with gladness, we would pray to you with openness, knowing that you are the one who is strong, you are the one who is powerful, you are the one who is mighty and sovereign to do all of these things, to not only change our circumstances, to not only put us on a different path, Lord, but that you are strong enough to change the hearts of men and women around us, to give us favor and to not stop there, but to pave the way for the advancement of your gospel, both in our lives and in the world around us. And so, Lord, as we close out this series, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and pray that you would continue to walk with us. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit as we continue to seek renewal in our relationship with you. We pray all these things in the great name of Jesus, who taught us that when we pray, we should pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as the people of God, let us once again proclaim the words of the Apostles' Creed. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we want to take a moment to celebrate God's goodness and grace and share a little bit about how we are alive and pursuing Jesus together. What that looks like is that we want every person to be involved here at Spry Church through serving, giving, and praying. Uh, Jesus says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so to follow Jesus means to be like him and to serve. It means that we give ourselves so that other people can know Jesus. 
Everything that happens through our church is a result of God's generosity being lived out by you. And so your giving helps us share the love of Jesus with those around us. And so also we pray saying that we believe in the power of God, knowing that God hears our prayers and invites us to pray to him. As a church, we pray for one another and for the needs of our community and our world. And what we know is that great things happen as God's people pray together. Through your prayers, your giving, and your serving, we are pursuing Jesus together and lives are being touched with the power and the love of God. Thank you for continuing to walk with us as a church and for continuing to support what God is doing here. If you would like to give to Spry Church, you can do so in three ways. By sending a check to the church office, by giving via text message through the number on your screen, or you can give online as well. Let's continue to worship by giving. For he heals my every heartache, and he 
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you're new to Spry Church, we invite you to fill out a connection card at sprychurch.com connection. If you leave your contact info, we'll be glad to send you church updates, answer your questions, and also connect with you. If you're married, we invite you to give your marriage the gift of the marriage course, which is coming to you in the comfort of your own home. Uh, beginning Wednesday, February 9th from 7 to 9 p.m. and running for seven consecutive weeks, the Marriage Course offers couples practical support for strengthening your relationship no matter how long you've been married. Uh, the sessions are completely private, so cameras and sound on Zoom are off. There's no group work to be done, so it's just you and your spouse or your significant other. Uh, the seven sessions, they help you to understand each other's needs, help you to communicate more effectively, help you grow closer by learning methods to resolve conflict. Not that any of you have that, of course. Uh, recover from ways that maybe you've hurt each other in the past. Uh, recognize how your upbringing affects your relationship and much more as well. Uh, there's no fee to attend the marriage course and the course workbooks can even be downloaded for free as well. To secure your spot in the class, please register at the address on your screen. Uh, this is an enriching experience that we're pleased to recommend to all married couples and I can give it my stamp of approval as well because my wife Becky and I have been through it and it is a great experience for you and for the strengthening of your marriage. Now the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.